Well, good morning. It is late May in Nova Scotia. The temperature this morning at uh, 9.30 is already 18 degrees Celsius. That tells me we're going to have a warm day here. I'm absolutely excited for it. Mostly a cloud-free sky, a little bit of thin light clouds up above. No breeze, and yes, the black flies are out. But it's one of those days that you just feel like being in the woods. I'll, well, okay, I'll say that now, but let's see what the end of the day after I have to hike back out. So my plan for the day is I'm going about 12 kilometers into the wilderness. It'll take me about an hour and a half, maybe a little longer to get to where I want to be. I plan on setting up and having a lunch, kind of a unique thing. It's nothing I've ever shown before here on the meal. Doesn't matter if you're on a low carb keto diet or not. This is something that may interest you. And uh, I'm testing out some new equipment, stuff that I will eventually be reviewing. Uh, I'll give you a hint. If that says anything, I usually don't carry my hiking poles other than with my snowshoes. So if that gives you a hint, well, you'll see it in a few minutes anyway. So yeah, I invite you to come along. I'll see if there's anything worth showing you along the way. It's been a long time since I've done this type of video, so hopefully I, I remember how to do this. All right, follow along. I thought I'd stop and give you a view of this pretty flowering bush here in the wilderness area. This is Rhodora, and Rhodora has this pretty pinkish flower, pinkish reddish flower, I guess, a little bit of a purple, not the best with color descriptions. It is a, a mid-height bush, and it looks a lot like sheep, uh, or lamb's kill, or sheep laurel, which is a lower uh, growing bush around here, which also comes out with a purplish power or flower probably in another couple of weeks. Uh, yeah, this is kind of pretty. Now, it's not the first thing to flower around here. We get Mayflowers in early May, but uh, this is one of the nicer ones to have a look at. See what else I can find you. Another one of interest, at least to me, and I've actually done a video on this one. This is wild sarsaparilla. And it's going to get much bigger than that. This, this is probably only a few days out of the ground. I want you to notice the copperish color. Now it's turned, starting to turn green, but it does have a copperish color. I'll tell you, one of the varieties of poison ivy in our area, not that it would grow this far off, off of the water, has a very similar color and look. So early in the spring, you may confuse this for poison ivy, at least locally. But uh, another week or two, it'll just be a huge, looks like a fronding, a uh, fern of some type with a nice green leaves on it. And if you're interested, I do, like I mentioned, I have a video on how you can turn this into a nice tasting tea. So this is promising. It's, like I said, late May. And these are blueberry blossoms. They're just coming out. It'll be a few weeks to a month yet before the blueberries are ready to pick, but there's quite a few on this little bush off the side of the trail here. So uh, I'm excited that it might be a good year for blueberries. Another plant I don't often see at this stage in its life cycle. This is Clintonia, sometimes called corn lily and sometimes called bluebell lily. And uh, you can see coming out of the center of the stalk, a, well, it'll flower and then you'll see these pastel blue berries eventually form on them. Now, the berries are not known to be edible, actually the rumored, I say rumored because I haven't really any seen any proof that they could be toxic, however, the leaves, especially at this young age, are fully edible and they have a distinct flavor. And I'll spoil it for you, it's cucumber, but if you ever get a chance and you can positively ID this plant, Clintonia, then uh, try a leaf, just give it a little chew. If it tastes like cucumber, you've got the right one. One of the many bays and inlets around this lake, this is Susie Lake, if I haven't mentioned that already, in the Blue Mountain Birch Cove Lakes Wilderness. You know, I could stop here get my chair out and not move the rest of the day and be perfectly happy. But like I said, I do have a plan, so let's keep going. So I'll tell you the difference one week makes. I was out here a week ago and none of these evergreens were starting to put out their new growth tips on them. One week later and they're well out. This is a small balsam fir standing about four and a half feet tall and those tips are enjoyable right off the branch. Just tuck them in. Mm, nice taste of spring. 
I have a full video on spruce tips primarily, but similar, you can do the same things with the balsam fir tips. Okay, I'm here. Where's here? A long ways into the wilderness, or at least longer than I've been in some time. <sighs> Starting to cloud over. That takes some of the intensity of the heat away, but not the black flies. You can probably see them all over me. All right, this is my spot for the day. I am looking for a spot. I think I see one over here to set something up. But uh, before I get to doing any of my product testing, i have a cup of tea, I think, and a snack. All right, so here's the first item that I brought out to do some testing on. This is the Lanshan Pro 2, the 3ULF Lanshan Pro 2. I think I've got that right. Uh, sent to me by Campers List to test out and review. This is my second setup, my first in the woods. The first setup I did was in my own backyard. And you know, I'll tell you, there's Good lessons to be learned by setting it up in the woods. It's not near as taut as I would like to see it, and I'm going to have to work on that. But what I discovered on YouTube is that most of the people that are reviewing this, now this isn't a criticism of everyone, and it's also a matter of, I understand from a somebody who does, who makes videos, how challenging it can be sometimes to get an actual setup out in the woods. But most of them are done in their backyards, perfectly manicured, flat lawns. And when I did that at home, it went up real easy. Now, it still went up easy here, but uh, the, this is the flattest spot I could find in this local woodland. And basically, I'll be laying on roots and a little hollow in the middle, little lumps on either side. And yeah, that's, so it's, there's lessons to be learned on how to try and get it taut. And as I say, you can see that it's not taut, or not as taut as I'd like to have it to withstand any serious amount of wind. The other thing I discovered, it comes with, what, six inch tent poles, I think it is. And the ground here is duff, duff being just mostly organic matter, very loose. I'm gonna have to buy some 10 inch poles or make some poles when I get out here to uh, make sure that I get the anchorage I need in depth. But I'll just continue the walk around. From where I'm sitting, now you can see the hollow. Look how there's a hollow there and that's the side I think I'll choose to get in and out of just to, to take advantage of that hollow. The other thing I have not done with this tent that is recommended by 3ULF, again, I think I'm getting that right, is to seam seal it. So one of the differences of this, the second generation tent over the first, is that they have lessened the amount of seams, but all up and down the edge there were the poles, the little black patch, uh, where the poles are holding it up, all these other tie-out points, they must be seam sealed and they do give you instructions and provide a little syringe for doing it. But if you don't do that and you get out in a rainstorm, you will get wet, at least according to the reviews I've seen where people <laughs> did exactly that. I don't need to seal it and get out and got wet. So yeah, that'll be a real world, world test. What I can say though, so far is, this being my first trekking pole tent, now you know why I was carrying the trekking poles, this being my first trekking pole tent, it's lighter, it's actually very easy to set up, it uh, goes up very quickly, and because the inner tent and the outer tent are all one, there's no fly and screen tent, because it's all one, it uh, should be easier to set up without getting the inside of the tent wet, because basically you set it up with the floor down and the roof on top, and then it's just a matter of lifting the roof off of the floor, to put it probably an oversimplification. However, all those tie-out points, that's absolutely required to set this tent up, and that's where it can be a bit of a challenge finding just the right site. Now there is something I think I can get in close enough. Right up here in the corner, there are little tie-out points, so if I wanted to, and I may try it, if not for uh, the review, but at least for the experience, is run a guy line 
or a ridge line between two trees, if I can find just the right trees with a flat spot underneath, and set it up that way without the tent or the hiking poles. If I can do that, I'll lighten the load considerably, but I expect that will be a, a bit of a challenge to find just the right spot. And yes, you can buy dedicated poles just for this purpose if you don't like using hiking poles. And yes, I could cut some sticks, which is an option I will consider. But, you know, trying to set it up a way, the way that it was intended by the manufacturer first and then talk about modifications. And there are a great number of hacks, mods on the internet for, to improve the performance of this tent. I'll be taking advantage of some of them. If I make those changes before I do the review, I'll point out what the changes are. One criticism of this tent, but it's not a criticism of this tent specifically, but of tents of this style where there is no screen house inside and fly over the top, is condensation. So you do have to have enough uh, airflow through it. And I'm noticing even now, this is an airflow area up here with mesh. It doesn't seem to be as open as it could be and it could be the way that I have or the guidelines are staked out here. Single stake. Again, lots I can be doing with it. Not a review, but just to say I'm kind of excited about this. This uh, is one of the nicer tents that I have owned. Seems to do a lot of things that the others I have don't do, but a bit of a challenge in some circumstances to set up. All right, stay tuned and keep an eye out for that review. All right, so what started out today as a really nice sunny day, warm temperatures, very little wind, has turned into a clouded over sky. <laughs> Not, no threat of rain, but a clouded over sky and the wind has picked up considerably. I keep having to move my chair to see if I can put my back to the wind so I can record uh, this video. And, uh, you know, still a great day to be in the woods, don't get me wrong. I'm going to enjoy a beautiful lunch in a few moments' time, but uh, it just makes recording challenging, to say the least. Okay, so I have two more items I want to share with you before I start my lunch. Items that I have, well, one is the first time I've brought it out in the woods today, and the other one I've had on a few occasions. It may have shown up in videos, but I'm not ready yet to give it a review. I really haven't put it through its paces, but I wanted to share it with you anyway. So that's a knife, and it will be another knife in the budget series lineup of knives. And this is the Venturer, or Adventurer, from BPS Knives. Now, BPS Knives is a Ukrainian brand. And, uh, okay, so two things. They make a really nice knife for a really good price. The problem is right now, as you are all aware, there is a war going on in the Ukraine. So production has shut down temporarily, I hope. So uh, I will continue to test this knife out. I will eventually review, but I'm hoping by the time that I do the review that the war is over, that they were able to start rebuilding their companies and their country and uh, maybe start putting these back into production because it would be a shame for the world to be denied this knife and the other ones in its lineup. So I can't, I'm not gonna tell you very much about it other than, well, just some superficial things. So the adventurer, is a good size knife, five and a half inch blade, and this is not a full spec rundown. It is made with a steel that is not normally considered high carbon. It is high carbon, just not as high as a lot of steels, and that is 1065. So the question is, is that a high enough carbon steel to be using in knives, and will it hold an edge, and will it perform? Well, uh, the only sharpening I've had to do it so, with it so far has been to run it down a ceramic rod and strop it. Now, I haven't gotten any nicks or any rolls. I suspect with the hardness of this knife, which is somewhere around 58, 59 on the Rockwell scale, it probably won't chip. I say probably because, I, again, I don't know for sure. If anything, it may roll, which is preferable because it's usually a little easier to get out. I can tell you that it takes an incredibly sharp edge on it. I mean, this is hair popping sharp the way it came from the factory. And, you know, yes, it has lost its hair popping edge when I do some woodwork, but it doesn't take much to bring it back. Very sharp spine across the back. I didn't have to do anything to modify that to make it strike a ferrocerium rod or scrape bark or, or fat wood or anything like that. It is thin stock, about one eighth thin stock. 
and uh, it's quite a high knife. So I have been batoning this knife. I have no fear that this knife is too small to baton. A lot of it has to do with the depth here. I mean, it is quite deep. Uh, so what are the, the outright or the, the positives? Hardwood handles on a carbon steel knife. At that price point, nothing special. I mean, this isn't a, a sh showpiece, but it is a functional wood with very traditional materials. And look at the sheath. This may be the highlight. Look at this sheath. Beautiful leather, nice thick welt on it. It is riveted. It does have a belt loop, but it also has a dedicated dangler attached to it. Now, it's not thick in, or in terms of width, either on the dangler or the belt loop, but uh, you know, it's nicely finished. It's an oiled sheath. It rides quite low on the belt. I do like that. And it came with a ferrocerium rod. I mean, what else can you ask for? I hesitate to put the price on. I will. If they're still, that price is still available, they are available on Amazon. If the price is still available, I will uh, put it on the video just to let you know. But again, my understanding is that they're temporarily halted in production. But I will continue to test this out. Um, one thing I can say about it is the handle is plenty long for all the purchase of my XL hand, but it's not very wide this way. So it it's not the ideal knife for me, but I think it'll suit most people. It is not especially wide in the handle, but I can deal with that because the scales are removable. So I could put liners in very easily just to give it a little bit more width. I think that would help considerably. Yeah, okay, so good knife. I will put it through its paces and I'll report back to you at some point in the future. There's how it sits in the sheath. So what is the other item that I'm testing out? or another one of the items I'm testing out. Well, some time ago, I entered a giveaway on a fellow YouTube uh, channel, Barnyard Outdoors, the fellow's name is Chris, and I'll make sure that I put a link in this video. Chris uh, is a bit of a gear junkie, surprise, kind of like me, maybe that's why I like to watch him. He likes his uh, toys, and as do I, and he has been offering a lot of giveaways, which is really quite a, very generous of him. He's not sponsored, and he's not receiving any compensation for doing any of these videos. So uh, he buys these things. He buys one for himself, he reviews it, and then he gives the, the other one away. So another one, like he buys two at the same time. So what he put up for... Uh, uh, a, a review and, and a giveaway was a water filter. Now, this is the reason I entered this giveaway. It's not that I couldn't afford to buy my own, because yes, I could have. But the reason I put up, I wanted to see if I could win it, and I did, is because this is something I've been wanting to test out for some time, and that is the VersaFlow water filter from Hydro Blue. Hydro Hydro Blue, yes. And I've been wanting to test it. It looks an awful lot like the Sawyer, doesn't it? In fact, I think it probably is an awful lot like the Sawyer in many ways. But it should have some advantages to the Sawyer. Just some of the things, it's much easier to, you can see it'll go in line. So you can put it right in line on a, a water bladder in your backpack or any other system you want to do. You want to do a gravity filter system, you can put this in line. Uh, it has specs very similar to the Sawyer, maybe a little better if I recall, again, not a review, arrow for the flow, silicone caps on either end, and it came with, now the, Chris added this as well, it came with an additional filter that you attach to the end of it. This is a carbon filter. So while the uh, filter material, and it's the typical technologies that are in most filters today, while it will remove all the nasties that are in the water, they, quite often they don't remove bad flavors. So if you've got a lot of tannins or, I don't know, other things in the water, and heavy metals and chemicals and things like that, if you want to remove those, you need a carbon filter on top of the uh, filter that's inside of this. I mean, this is 0 .0, 0 0.0.1 or 0.01 micron filter fiber, so it'll take out all the organisms that uh, will cause you harm. But it takes a little finer and another technology on top of that to really add to the uh, filter. So here's the filter. This is the flow direction from this end through this end. And if you want to add the added filter, you just screw it on. It's longer now, but now I've got a filter with a carbon filter on the end of it. So I get the benefits of that on the top of it. Now, along with this, Chris sent a Maxpedition 
mesh pouch for carrying it in. And this is really nice. I mean, obviously, Maxpedition qualities are outstanding. But one of the things I like about mesh pouches like this for water filters is, is you're putting stuff away wet, usually, after you use them. Uh, they're going to dry off very quickly inside of this bag. Inside with it, uh, well, there's instructions. You can probably see it through there, the instructions for the Hydro Blue VersaFlow. But there are some additional things that can be used to attach it to a bag for inline use. Uh, again, not a review. So for today's use though, I'm going to set it up a little differently. And along with that came two bags that you would fill up at Streamside, similar to the kind that comes with the, um, uh, the Sawyer filter. Uh, they're good bags, don't get me wrong, but if anyone who has tried filling up those bags at Streamside, the ones that come with the Sawyer or this style, you know how much of a challenge it can be to get them full of water unless you have some way of pouring water into them, which is viable. I mean, it does work. But of course, I came across something a few years ago that I did a review on that I tend to use with most of my filters now. And that is this water bladder from Canuck. It's called the Vecto, the Canuck Vecto. And they come in different sizes. And this is one of the first or second generation ones, but I mean, it's still effective. There has been some upgrades and it's with one of my other system, but that is a full liter and, oh God, that's a full two liters. It says right on the side, that's two liters of water I have here that I can filter up. And they're so easy to use. And I, I won't, again, it's, I have a review on the Canuck Vecto that uh, it's so easy to use. I'm gonna set it up right now for filtering some water just to show you it operation. Point it right into my water bottle. So take the end off of the water bag, put it aside. Flow direction is this way. So this is a first use. I think one of the reasons why I was interested in getting the, uh, what is this called again? <laughs> the VersaFlow from Hydro Blue is when I was testing the Sawyer with this bag, uh, the first couple of generations of bags, there are I think a three, maybe even a four generation bag now from Canuck, is that um, it would leak around the seams quite easily. It was hard to get a proper seal. It's just something about, and it, it only happened with the Sawyer. It didn't happen like it, like all the bottle caps and everything else. It wouldn't, wasn't a problem. It was just this combination. Well, they've since resolved that. But I remember early on, I had read or watched somewhere that the VersaFlow didn't have that issue. Well, we're about to see. So I'll turn it upside down. Ooh, water flows nice and quickly. See if I can get that in the picture. Yeah, no leaking taking place there. No problem at all, actually. That's great. Well, it won't take long to fill this water bottle up. All right, well, I'm not going to make you watch me filter water out, but just to show you that this is working and I get some use of it. I get my stats down properly so I can give them to you. Uh, I'll do a review on this. But uh, again, I just want to thank Chris for sending this to me and uh, give him a shout out. It's a great channel, has lots of fun. He's got good presentation skills. It's a very small following at this point, but I think you'll agree that, well, if you like the style of video he does, and, and I do, I, I think you'll agree that he has some good material there and uh, I'm, I'm excited to watch his channel grow. Okay, uh, once I've filtered my water through, I'm gonna set up for my lunch. There is an item here that I wanna share with you first. The stove that I'm gonna be using is my siege stoves. Tit uh, titanium Gen 2 flat pack stove. That's what this is referred to. I did a review on this some time ago and it was one that was loaned to me by a friend. And at the end of that video, I made the comment that I liked it so much, I was buying my own and I did. I bought my own. So this is brand new, has not been used. Would have been better to christen it with a fire, but I'm okay using it with charcoal. It is gonna be perfect for this use. But the item I wanna share with you is what is underneath it. So this is something I picked up off of uh, Amazon. Yes, Amazon. And I will be sure to give you the link. This is a fiberglass mat, a little tiny mat. It comes in at under two ounces. Actually, I'll throw the, the specs as well as the link in the, in the video description. 
But look at this, look how tiny that is. This is just an added piece of insurance that you can have with you when you're using your wood stove, fire ban or not. I'll probably be using this under a lot of my wood stoves. Very inexpensive, very easy to use obviously, and just gives me another sense of calmness. Now you can see I went down to the lakeside and I picked up a couple of stones that I'm using as well on top of the duff and plus I cleaned out all the needles and everything as much as I could underneath it plus I have a windscreen so I'm trying to do everything to make this safe plus I have a large reservoir of water handy that I can use should it get out of control. Uh, I usually don't have any problems with this so I got a bag of charcoal here to get this lit, and that's all I'm going to do right now on, on video, is get it lit, and then I will uh, bring it back when I go to make my lunch. Wood wool. So I've got to make sure this stays inside as I light it. Hoping that the, uh, you're not getting too much wind noise from the wind. I am trying to shield my microphone so that You won't get too much wind noise. All right, my wood wool is starting to catch on. I can start to throw a few pieces of charcoal in. I have a combination of just regular chunk charcoal and briquettes, kind of using up the ends of a couple of bags. All right. The trick is, as always, is not to put out your flame when you start the charcoal going. It looks pretty good. Good, I'm getting something going here. Take the time to kind of place my charcoal. Okay, there you go. Still going? Yep, still going. It's going to take a little while for this to really heat up and engage all the charcoal. And once that is done, I'll bring it back and share what my lunch is going to be. It's, some, it's something special, really. It really is something simple and special. All right, bring it back in a little while. Oh yeah, oh yeah, lots of heat coming out of that now. All right, let's get this started. So today's lunch is what I'm calling a real bacon cheeseburger. Now, what do I mean by that when I say real bacon cheeseburger? It will definitely is gonna have some bacon, which I get to get on very quickly here. It won't have a hamburger, pork burger, or anything else. It's actually gonna have a piece of grilling cheese. So the burger itself is cheese. And this is the product. I picked it up in a grocery store here not too long ago. It comes two to the package and I thought I'd give it a try. And basically what it says is soft ripened cheese, two to a package. Uh, I'll give you very quickly the nutritional information on the back of it, but I won't, uh, there's not much more I can say about it. Uh, one of these, one of these burgers comes in at 300 calories, 25 grams of fat, zero fiber, zero sugar, zero any, any types of carbohydrates, 17 grams of protein. Yeah, so that's, that's pretty darn good, actually. That's a very good mix right there. The instructions are easy. Remove wrapping, pierce with a fork three times on both sides, grill for four minutes on each side, and then you're good to go. Uh, yeah, okay, so I don't know if you have seen these in the grocery store. I don't know if they're available. Well, where you might find them, I must have a look around and see if I can find these more. If you happen to know where I can find more of these, uh, let me know, please, because I think they're going to turn out to be something really quite special. All right, bacon first. Now, that is getting hot. I hope it's not too hot, but let's get the bacon on. So the bacon being the first thing. Probably going to stick to the pan or stick to the grill. But it won't take very long to cook at this heat either. Kind of stringy, isn't it? About the only thing I can do now is just work this bacon back and forth until it is cooked. And then I'm just going to toast up the bun very quickly. And then we'll put that burger on and I'll show doing that. So I'll bring it back in a few minutes. Lots and lots of heat in there. So it didn't take long for my bacon to cook up, uh, <laughs> crisped up quite nicely. All I'm going to do right now is just for a couple of seconds, and you can see it already starting to smoke a little bit, is to give my bun a bit of a grilling. Not very much at all, just to, you know, just to make it a little crispy, not much. Boy, the bacon fat 
dripped all over this uh, fiberglass mat. Oh well, that happens. I think it's time to take that one off. Look at that. Whoa, almost too much. Woo! All right, maybe. Yeah, I'll do it. I'll just have to give it 10 seconds. I mean, that is how hot that is. That's cooking up that quickly. I don't think it's going to take very long at all. All right, that's more of what I wanted right there, just to warm it up. Now, I have that block of cheese. Let me bring it up a little bit. It's just the size of a burger. This is going to be perfect. It smells like cheese. All right, it says give it some holes. And get it on the grill. Now, how am I going to flip that? I've got a fork and a pair of tongs here. I think it'll work. Now, you probably can't hear that, but I can hear the sizzling taking place. Man, there's a pile of heat coming out of that thing. That titanium has definitely changed color now. All right, it probably will take a minute or two. It said four minutes aside, so I will bring it back just as I'm ready to take it off so you can see what it looks like. And then we'll do a taste test, of course. All right. I think some of the cheese may be starting to drip through. Okay, so what I'm going to do very quickly here is take this off the heat. Show you, it uh, it grilled on top. There's a nice grilling on the outs in, on top. It's nice and soft on the inside. There's some, see what it looks like on the other side. Oh yeah, yeah, that looks great, eh? Okay, so what I'm going to do is just reposition the camera here because I want to show you assembling my meal. Okay, so there is my burger. Now, on top of this, I spread some homemade uh, sriracha mayo, homemade mayonnaise. If you're interested in how that's done, I can share that sometime with some sriracha sauce to give it some spice. So I will put my burger, ooh, that's still hot, very hot, on the bottom half. That aside, put my bacon on top. Nice crispy bacon. That little piece is going to have to be a taste test. Put it all together. Oh, Jesus. Steaming hot and, and soft. Okay, there it is. I'll reposition the camera and we'll do a taste test. Let's see if I can show you what my burger looks like. I know if I get my face out of the way, that it should focus in there. That looks good to me. All right. But it's not what it looks like. Well, in part, it's what it looks like, right? It's more about what it tastes like. My bandana. It is a little juicy. All right, here we go. Hmm. Okay. I have to find out where I can buy more of those at. If I can find them, again at the grocery store, I'll name the grocery, okay, it was, I'll tell you where I did find them the first time was Sobeys here in Halifax. Uh, you may have Sobeys where you are, you may not. If you don't have Sobeys, or if you do, if you look around and you see those, please let me know. If you see them, buy them. You're gonna wanna try this. I mean, it's so simple, right? It's more about the texture of the cheese than it is the flavor. The flavor is there, but it's not an overly strong flavor. It just makes a nice, soft uh, cheese, grilled cheese in a burger. So it's whatever you do, it's the toppings that you're going to put on it. The bun, the sriracha mayo, the bacon. That's what's making this burger stand out so well. Mm. The cheese is just soft, ripened cheese, so it's not a mozzarella, a cheddar, or anything else. Just a simple cheese. It did, as you can see, brown up, but it didn't burn, it didn't melt and drip through my grill. And that was a lot of heat, too. Mmm. Oh, yeah. I'll be looking for these things. Okay. 
as good as this is, a day out in the woods where you're just playing with toys is not going to be complete unless you have a good cup of coffee. At least that's for me. So I'll enjoy my burger, I'll put some water on, and I'll make a cup of coffee, and we'll sit back and maybe have a few more comments. Something else I haven't done for myself for a while is to use my AeroPress to make my coffee. No special reason, just, you know, doing other different things. But today it is the AeroPress because it is still my favorite. Oh yes, and still my favorite is the Rampage Coffee. So shout out to Rampage Coffee and I will of course put the link in. This is ground a little bit coarse because I have been using French press lately. Put in three, actually I'm going to put in a real good heaping scoop of coffee for that number three. Spilled some of it. I'm just using my dinner plate, my stainless steel plate to stabilize it a little bit on the uneven surface here. And my water is boiling, boiling hard. Boiling actually a little bit too hard almost. That's just on the leftover heat from the charcoal. Try not to burn myself as I do this. Give it a little stir. Put the cap on. Using the inverted method, I find it's the best if you want to do a longer steep. And if you've got coarser coffee, maybe you do want to do a longer steep. So three, four minutes steeping like that. And then of course I'll flip it upside down and put it back on top of the cup that I have here. Uh, I don't think I'm going to pour most of that water out. Won't need it. It'll be a strong here. So I'll have a slight dilution of water in the bottom of the cup. So I'll give that three or four minutes. I'll give it a push and uh, maybe then we'll see where this video goes from there. Oh yeah, a little strong, that's okay. Come on camera, focus in there. Camera's having trouble with the light in the trees, you know, moves through, gets light, gets dark, gets light, gets dark. Ah, so I said when I opened the video up that I haven't done a video like this in quite some time. It may have been last summer since I did a video like this. And by like this, I mean just a, come on, follow along video where I just carry the camera up record things that I think you might be of interest in seeing, uh, have a lunch, test out some equipment, you know, not going out with the express purpose of reviewing items or demonstrating skills, but more of just of a bit of an explore and have fun kind of a video. I miss doing that. There seems to be a certain amount of pressure that maybe I'm the only person that does it. Somehow I don't think so. That YouTuber con con content creators feel in terms of getting material out there to the audience. And you hope and you try and assess to make sure that you're meeting what the audience wants to see. But sometimes you get so caught up in doing it a specific way that uh, maybe you've missed the seeing the bigger picture. And I think that after a while it comes across that way. Laugh flies. It comes across that way. Maybe a little forced like it looks like I'm just doing videos to get those videos done. And in some cases, that's exactly what's happening is I'm not out here strictly for the enjoyment, which is what I should be. I'm out here to record videos and that's what it shouldn't be. So I'm going to try and change that up. I think the pressure is greater on me during the winter because my day is shorter. Uh, I want to combine doing videos along with getting out and having fun, making meals, but I'm compressed in my time. So now if I head out early in the morning and I don't get back until just before dark, then uh, that's a long day now, right now, at least until late summer anyway. <laughs> so I think I'll be doing more of these videos. I hope so. I, I, I'm starting to see all the wild edibles and medicinal starting to grow and I enjoy finding those and sharing those with you. I hope you enjoy it. Um, let me know about the content. I, I'm kind of opening this up to say what is the content you would like me 
to do most of in my videos. I do have products that are sent to me that I feel you want me to uh, show you. Uh, if you don't like to see the product reviews, tell me that. Uh, you know, I can always modify that up or I can do fewer of them. There is a certain obligation once you accept them. Now, I, I will be straight up, and you've probably heard this from other people as well. I accept about one in ten of the offers that come into me. And sometimes I accept them you know, questioning whether or not I should. And then I have to give it some thought before I respond back to the companies to, to tell them, yes, I will. I have to find out what is it about this product that my viewers might want to see. Showing you expensive gear uh, gets me free expensive gear, but is that what you want to see? You know, I have some items that I would not have been able to afford to buy otherwise. But I have a lot of items that are sent to me now, coming more and more, that are on the budget side. Not cheap, not free, not DIY, but they're still more affordable than a lot of the high-end stuff. So I'm trying to create a balance. Uh, when I have an opportunity to take things like, well, this. This is a Keith Titanium mug. And uh, by now, the, the series would have come out where I was sent their canteens, two different canteen sets, and I reviewed them. You know, I could not have afforded to buy those on my own, or at least I would have been hard-pressed to justify them, especially when there are less expensive alternatives. But some people want to buy those. So I guess the, for those people who can afford them, want the lightest, want the best, that's who that video is for. If you're not one of those people, feel free not to watch or tell me you didn't like it because it's outside of your budget range. I will endeavor, oh, well, no, not all endeavor. I promise to always be honest on my reviews. That's something I have a personal ethic around. I will not say something about a product just because it was sent to me. I like to find the good things to say about a product. If there's something I like about it, then I'll say that. But if there's something I don't like about it or needs improvement, I'll say that. Uh, it's burnt bridges. There have been companies that have sent me things and have changed their mind and not sent me any others. There have been companies that when I tell them what kind of reviews I do, change their mind and have not sent me items. I'm okay with that, to be quite honest. It's not like I need any of the things that are being offered me. Sometimes I just say, be kind of cool to have and kind of cool to share with you. Yeah, I'm doing a little bit of rambling because that's what this day is all about. Just sitting back and not necessarily have a specific type of content. Oh, a couple things I wanted to share here. Do you do this when you go out? A simple notebook and a little pouch, dollar store pouch that I, I bought for it. Uh, just a simple notebook. And I take down, I sit down and I make notes, usually while I'm having a cup of tea when I first arrive, then later in the day before I leave, things I need to do out on the trail, things I need to do at home, just a way of collecting myself. I don't get this kind of alone time anywhere else. This is the only place I really get to be by myself in my own thoughts. And that's a real vacation from the real world, isn't it? So I do take this along with me. Uh, you know, it's been paid off. I've had some great ideas for videos that I've also followed up on. So that's one thing I do. Do you do that? Do you take a notebook out with you? Now, here's another thing. I was in the, the thrift store the other day where I, I consider that my bushcraft supply store, the Value Village here in Halifax, that or the dollar store, those are the two where I seem to get a lot of my stuff at. And um, I always check the book aisle just to see if there's anything in the genre of things that I might like to read. And this is what I found recently, Bushcraft Basics. And I recognize the author's name, Leon Pattenberg. You may know Leon. He has a YouTube channel called Sur Survival Common Sense or Common Sense Survival. He's got a website and a um, YouTube channel. I'll make sure that there's links to his YouTube channel because I've watched uh, Leon's videos before. And he has a very good way of making things just sound like common sense. Now, th this isn't strictly a bushcraft book. Um, I was maybe a little disappointed. I guess it's what your definition of bushcraft is. I'm only a little over a third of the way through the book, so I really haven't given it a fair... It's not a review. Again, not a review. Bushcraft basics. I thought it was going to be all about bushcraft skills. And it is, but it's more about prepping for a bug out bag for situations where you may have to practice your basic bushcraft skills. A lot of the time in an urban setting. And quite often you'll, you'll see people cross over between bushcraft and survival as if they're the same thing. And I don't believe they are. 
a survival situation is, in my opinion, a short-term situation where I'm just trying to keep from dying, not necessarily thrive and enjoy and live in the outdoors, whereas bushcraft skills will help me survive in a bad situation, but more than that, they should help me thrive. Wilderness living skills. So in a survival situation, you don't need to know edibles and medicinal plants. You don't need to know trapping and all those type of things. That's for long term. Those are bushcraft skills. But having said that, shelter building, fire building, knowing the basics of how to stay alive, those are also bushcraft skills and survival skills. So I, yes, there's some crossover. So a lot of this had to do with survival skills, at least the first third of the book has, more than specific bushcraft skills. And hopefully there'll be more bushcraft related skills as I get further on in the book. But it did kind of give me a thought that what about practicing bushcraft skills in the city? I, I live in the city. It's a drive to get to where I go into the wilderness. It's a drive that I don't, it's, it's really close. Actually, I'm very fortunate how close it is. But I can get out here and I can practice real wilderness bushcraft skills. But what about for all the people that can't get out that often? Can they practice bushcraft skills in the city? And are they valuable to you living in the city, especially in a disaster type of a situation? Uh, yeah, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on that. I may do a few videos just around that topic. I think it's of interest. It is to me. Hopefully it is to you. Let me know. Okay, I am going to sit back and enjoy the rest of my coffee because that's, again, what this day is all about. I'll pick up Leon's book, maybe read another chapter or two. Uh, this, I'm not closing the video out yet because it's, well, it's only four o'clock in the afternoon. I'm not ready to leave yet. And I want to see what else I can find to share with you. But I'll at least close the video out if I don't find anything else to share with you. But uh, yeah, we'll talk in a little while. All right, I'm on my way out of the woods and I just crossed over this little stream and I stopped to tie my shoes and realized I was looking at some very young poison ivy here. Now this is the vining type. You can see it here. Maybe you can see some of the younger leaves have that same bronzy color. Maybe there, how about that? That same bronzy color that the other plant had, the uh, wild sarsaparilla. There's no way you're going to confuse that though with anything other than what it is. At this point though, you can almost mistake them for strawberry leaves just because of the edges and the three leaves and everything. But uh, no, that's poison ivy. So this is bunchberry, sometimes called crackerberry, very young yet. You can see the flower just starting out. In a few months' time, there'll be some nice little red berries in the center of each of those flowers. Very edible, not tasty. They're very plain, in fact, and kind of seedy, but uh, still edible, can make a nice trail snack. Another one over there. You know, I'll be honest, I'm not used to using hiking poles for hiking with. I've used my staff for ever. I think the only time I've actually used these hiking poles was during the winter with my snowshoes and the baskets on the end of them. Makes a big difference when you're snowshoeing, but they actually feel like more of a nuisance for me, at least on the trails, like you just saw me coming down the hill there. That's probably where they're at their best in here, just to kind of arrest my forward momentum a little bit, we'll say, so that I don't go down on my face, which I've done, of course. Um, yeah, I'm just not used to it. Let me know if you use hiking poles. I'd be interested. I can see on some trails, maybe hard packed trails that don't have all the roots and rocks that I climb over, that they may be more of an advantage. I know the theory is to shift some of the weight onto your arms, through your shoulders, so that it's not all carried on your back and hips and legs. Yeah, but it just seems to be a little unnatural for me. I'm going to have to rethink this with that tent that I, I showed you today. All right, so it's been a long day. I probably look a lot more tired than I did when I first started. And that's because I am, but I'm a happy man. There's no question I had a great day in the woods. I was glad I could bring you along. I was glad I could show you a few things, have just a bit of a chat on what's going on here with the, the channel. And uh, yeah. Great lunch. We're, I'm walking it off now. I've, st I've still got 45 minutes before I'm even out of the woods where my car is, so got a bit of a ways to go yet. I don't think I'll find anything else at this point. There may be one thing that I want to share with you that uh, if I can, I will, but clouds are coming in. 
rain is forecast for overnight. So yeah, and I'm not in any risk of rain right now, but it is coming and I welcome it. I so welcome it because it's uh, the forest is so dry right now. Very, very dangerous. Okay, that's all I have. If you have any comments or questions, I will put all the information for all the toys, all the products, information that I have so far, I'll put them in the video description below if you're interested. If you want to know more about any of those, just say so. If you have anything else you'd like me to discuss or make videos on, just say so. All in the comments section. But until next time, get out and explore and take that path less traveled because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.